Well, my next guest really needs no introduction. That is because he's one of the most highly respected researchers covering the topics we're going to cover today on this show. But I'm going to give him an introduction because he deserves it. A long storied career. Dr. Michael Sala is an internationally recognized scholar in international politics, conflict resolution, U.S. foreign policy. He has held academic appointments in the School of International Service, the Center for Global Peace, American University in Washington, D.C., the Department of Political Science uh, in Australia. Dr. Sala is popular, maybe more popularly known to you if you're watching this as a pioneer in the development of exopolitics. What is exopolitics? The study of the main actors, institutions, and political processes associated with extraterrestrial life, the interaction between human beings and extraterrestrial life. He has a brand new book out. Uh, I'm almost finished with it. I have so many notes, I can't put it down. It's called U.S. Army Insider Missions, Space Arcs, Underground Cities, and E.T. Contacts. And Dr. Sala is our guest today on the show. Dr. Sala, great to see you here. Thanks, Clayton, for having me. Real pleasure, real treat to have you here. And, um, you know, I have to say, we're going to cover a lot of ground today, and I want our audience to come at this with an open mind. And, uh, and you may have some preconceived notions about things in the universe, and you maybe sit there with your arms crossed for most of the time when you hear topics like this, but I really want people, our audience, to come at this uh, from a place of, of openness uh, and allow Dr. Sala to really uh, talk about his experience here. Uh, so Dr. Sala, this week, I want to start with what we saw this week. We saw... Uh, you, uh, we saw a whistleblower well, over the past week or so come forward, a Pentagon whistleblower, and in a series of, of reports and interviews saying that he filed a complaint with the Pentagon because of the suppression of UFOs, of craft that the United States has in its possession, alien bodies, etc. This information is being kept from the American public. His name is David Grush, apparently has uh, the highest level of clearance. Uh, inside the Pentagon, and there's been mixed reaction to his uh, his whistleblower testimony coming forward and talking uh, and telling the world about this. What was your initial response to seeing this? Because you have a lot of experience dealing with these whistleblowers who've come forward to reveal similar things. What did you think this week when you saw this? Well, I thought it was very significant that, uh, firstly, that story that was published in the debrief was first passed by the New York Times, uh, Politico, and The Hill, and that they the authors had to run it through the debrief, even though they had previously published in the New York Times similar stories uh, with their kind of rigorous background checking of the witnesses. So, you know, straight away you, you get a clue that there's some kind of uh, different factions uh, involved in this kind of issue concerning uh, UFO crash retrievals and reverse engineering efforts. And I think what we saw with uh, David Grush's uh, testimony is that you know, there, there is a faction of people behind him that are encouraging him to come forward to reveal this because this is the time for the American public to know that these kinds of uh, reverse engineering projects concerning retrieved extraterrestrial spacecraft that go all the way back. I mean, the earliest uh, instance that I know of was uh, Cape Girardeau in 1941 in Missouri. So that, that was the home state of uh, President Harry Truman and, and one of the factors that maybe led to him becoming president. So you go all that way back and there have been like, uh, so that's 80 years, 80 years of these crash retrievals happening in the United States and elsewhere around the world with lots of people coming forward talking about the existence of these crash retrieval operations and that there has been reverse engineering going on. And of course, you know, that's been dismissed and ridiculed uh, all that time. And so now to have such a senior bureaucrat uh, such as David Grush coming forward saying, you know, not only that this is going on, um, but but also that uh, there, there is a concerted effort by the Arrow office to just ignore that data. And and you, you, you contrast what he revealed in terms of, you know, these are extraterrestrial craft and even bodies are involved with the response 
by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick to the idea that some of the uh, UAPs are extraterrestrial in origin and just dismissing that outright. So I think we're talking about two different factions or groups within the, the government military industrial complex that have opposing positions about how much and when to reveal about these reverse engineering projects. So two different factions. What do you think are the motivations of each of these factions? Well, you know, one faction just wants the truth to come out. And I think that's more the military faction uh, because they stand the, the most to benefit. I mean, if you look at it in terms of cost-benefit analysis, if uh, you suddenly have the existence of these alien technologies that can be reverse engineered to build spacecraft that are capable of kind of like interplanetary interstellar conflict or interstellar travel, uh, then you're going to have uh, the Navy wanting to have space carrier groups, you're going to have the Air Force or now Space Force wanting to have fleets of uh, anti-gravity craft that can go to Pluto and back, you know, in an hour, uh, you know, because that'll be a legitimate concern for the military that you know, in order to protect national security and global security. And on the, then on the other hand, you have the intelligence community that wants to keep this all secret because uh, the CIA and the National Reconnaissance Office, I mean, they have their own secret space program. And, and the more they keep this secret, uh, the more that they can use these craft that are built by uh, major companies such as Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, uh, Northrop uh, Grumman, to have their own fleets of covert spacecraft that they can use all around the planet for covert operations. So, you know, it goes back to that same struggle that goes to the, to the Kennedy administration and earlier uh, between uh, the U.S. military's legitimate concerns to... Uh, defend national security and, and having the equipment and the tools to do so with the intelligence community's desire to keep everything kind of secret and to maximize its own influence behind the scene and, and just kind of keep uh, the military um, at bay or restrict their access to these kinds of technologies. So, so that's ultimately what I think is going on here, Clayton, that you, know, you have a military uh, backed effort to reveal all this because they, they want to have their space cruisers, they want to have their uh, uh, battle fleets that are in deep space, as opposed to the intelligence community that, that want to keep all this under wraps because they get the benefit the most. Hmm. Interesting. Right. And the money, of course, follow the money in this situation, right? So what when you look at, when you look at the launch of the, the Space Force, how does the Space Force fit into these factions? Well, the Space Force was very important because you know, that was predicated on the idea that space is a warfighting domain uh, or, or, or a, a domain for potential conflict, whereas prior to that, prior to the creation of Space Force, space was considered a benign environment. So, so, the, so with that kind of definition, uh, you had the uh, 1967 Outer Space Treaty in effect, which basically said that uh, space is a benign environment. You can't have military bases up there. You can't have nuclear bases up, uh, nuclear weapons up there. That uh, space needs to be considered the, the kind of common, uh, for, for the common benefit of all humanity. Uh, but with the creation of Space Force, now space is considered a warfighting domain, which basically means that the, the Pentagon and, and, of course, Space Force and, and U.S. Space Command in particular now can actually deploy uh, assets deep into space because space is a contested battlefield now or could be a contested battlefield where you have China, Russia and, and any other kind of... Um, actors with uh, a presence in space that could threaten U.S. national security. So that, that was the big shift in terms of, you know, what was it that led to the creation of Space Force? And, and it's very interesting that just before the creation of Space Force, uh, looking at space as a, uh, a warfighting domain needing a dedicated military service was actually subjected to a gag order uh, by the Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Heather Wilson, who was the first secretary under um, President Trump. And there was a gag order. So uh, the uh, four-star general in, in running uh, the US Air Force couldn't talk about the need for creating a dedicated military space service that would 
be responsible for dealing with space as a warfighting domain. So that has all shifted now. And so that means that uh, space is one where you can actually have these future fleets involving anti-gravity craft being developed and deployed by Space Force and under the overall control of Space Command. Hmm. Did you believe David Grush's testimony when he came forward and spoke in, in what he was quoted as saying inside the debrief and then the subsequent television interview that he did for News Nation? Uh, definitely, yeah. I think uh, everything he said is uh, absolutely correct in terms of my own kind of research into this over the last 22 years that uh, there are people who have access to these classified programs that involve reverse engineering of captured extraterrestrial spacecraft and building fleets of uh, these uh, anti-gravity vehicles that are used for you know, select customers, which is basically the intelligence community and the, and the covert military, uh, special operations command and so forth. And so I think everything he said kind of matches uh, what others have said in the past. Now, you know, when we look at the motivation behind that, you know, is he, is he a mouthpiece for this faction that wants this information to come out, or is he a, a kind of setting up some kind of false flag operation or a, or a limited hangout where they they get ahead of the story? Because that's that's what's not clear at the moment. You know, what's the motivation behind it? Because I think it's very unusual for a whistleblower who. Uh, comes forward to talk about these things not being massively retaliated against in some way, uh, you know, given his uh, seniority that you know, doesn't appear to be anything other than just kind of like some you know, finger slapping or hand slapping here in, in terms of you know, the punishment he's suffered. So, uh, you know, there's definitely a faction behind him, whether it's uh, you know, the military or whether it's the intelligence community, but someone is I think giving him the green light to come forward and talk about this and protecting him. Uh, but yeah, we'll see whether, whether this is going to kind of like take us to a level where the uh, American public is going to be gaslighted for a future war involving some kind of contrived extraterrestrial threat, you know, the, the so-called false flag alien invasion that I know people like John D'Souza have been talking about for uh, well over a couple of years now. Yeah, which is what I fear, right? That this, yes, this is true, How, but how are they going to use it? What is the motivation behind using this information as some sort of a, uh, you know, a push towards a massive new military conflict and expansion of the, of the deep state? The military industrial complex has all, long been my fear about using this, and why are we hearing about this now? Uh, this week also, or last week, we heard from Dr. Stephen Greer, held a, a press conference with a number of individuals coming forward. Can you describe for me what you saw in that press conference and what stood out to you among the three people that he uh, that he featured? Well, he featured uh, three new whistleblowers out of a group of five that are going to be appearing at the National Press Club for a second press conference on Monday. And of those three, uh, they, they spoke about uh, their punishment or the, the kind of repercussions they faced um, after these kind of incidental encounters with these anti-gravity craft. And, and what was kind of like particularly uh, upsetting uh, for those watching was uh, how one of the witnesses described uh, the, this craft was involved in transporting massive amounts of uh, weapons and drugs. And that this is part of the kind of um, the black budget or the way in which the intelligence community raises funds to be able to kind of keep this all under wraps. And, and the person who witnessed this was uh, you know, punished as, as a result of that. And that, that's the common theme, that these were witnesses uh, to these craft that had been reverse engineered and were being used for uh, various purposes. And that those that witnessed these, because they weren't they weren't read in, because they weren't part of the projects. I mean, they were they were punished as a as a consequence of that. So I, th I think it's important to kind of point out. You know, there's a lot of other whistleblowers, insiders, who actually have been read in, are part of the programs, and you know, they've come out in the past after after retirement to talk about their involvement. You know, one one person. Uh, that stands out is uh, Clifford Stone, who says that he was part of these 
classified reverse engineer or classified crash retrieval operations from 1969 up until 1991 when he retired from the US Army and and so you know he was directly involved in the operation so he was read in and 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 another kind of kind of whistleblower uh, people like uh, JP this person I wrote about in uh, US Army insiders missions uh, he is actually active military and he is also being green lighted to talk about this because of agreements between the uh, military and the extra extraterrestrials that he's been involved with which is unbelievable so I want to get into that now so your new book again I've been tearing through it again I'm almost finished with it uh, and it just came out so everyone should go grab a copy of this and read up on this this is the U.S. Army Insiders Space Arcs Underground Cities and ET Contact and featured prominently in the book is your interactions with this person named JP who as you say is active military still in the military and well first of all can you describe JP who is he how did he come to reach out to you um and want to share this story with uh, it's an amazing story can you just give us a little background on who he is uh sure he first contacted me in 2008 uh, he had just returned from brazil where he had contact experiences with three human looking extraterrestrials that he calls nordics and over the subsequent years he developed uh, inventions he was brought to the attention of the covert military and uh, he formed a relationship with uh, Air Force operatives out of MacDill Air Force Base. He lived uh, right up until 2018. He lived in Tampa, Florida, which is where MacDill Air Force Base is located. And MacDill Air Force Base is the uh, home for Special Operations Command, which is where all of the military services uh, pool their resources to perform these missions all over the planet. And so he was contacted by these covert operatives out of mcdill and because they knew he was having extraterrestrial contacts you know they were trying to get information from him you know where are these extraterrestrials taking him uh what are they showing him what kind of technologies is is he being exposed to and it's very interesting um i, I discuss how he was taken to places where he was given uh, weapons training by extraterrestrials. So you know, here you have an individual, private individual, being given weapons training by extraterrestrials involving these exotic technologies. So I write about that in the book. And so by by 2019, uh, he decided because of the creation of Space Force and Space Command, he was he was told that he would be able to have greater access to these classified programs because his status as a civilian was a problem that that on a couple of occasions he was denied access to classified programs uh, because of the compartmentalized nature of of these because even though uh, the air force operatives involved in in this in, in these kinds of issues wanted him to have access uh, you have army and navy officials denying him access because he was a civilian so in 2019, he decided to join, uh, and the big motivation was the creation of Space Command and uh, the, the, the creation of, of uh, Space Force, because he was told that if he joined, he would be able to start serving with them. And that's exactly what happened in 2000, after he joined in 2019. Uh, soon he was performing missions for Space Command. Even though he joined the Army, he would be uh, given temporary duty and, and he would perform these missions for Space Command and I described various missions off planet to, to the moon, uh, to Jupiter's, uh, out in the orbit around Jupiter, uh, Ganymede, the moon, that you know, these anti-gravity technologies are so advanced that JP was able to get there and back in a day. I mean, they, they can travel to the moon, uh, to, to Jupiter and Ganymede in a day and come back. It's unbelievable. And this is where I want my audience right now to just have an open mind here. This is unbelievable to me. I mean, I've been doing research on the secret space program for years, uh, not to your level, of course, but I, I just can't, to me, this is the next step, this disclosure about the secret space program. Like the craft is one thing, the reverse engineering of these craft is one thing, but to know that the United States has actively been involved with extraterrestrials uh, having off-world meetings on moon bases, 
uh, for for decades, really. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here, right, Doctor? Well, that's right. Yeah, there's been uh, these relationships with different extraterrestrial uh, factions. And so this is where it becomes important that we distinguish between uh, different factions that uh, just as uh, humanity is divided into different nations with their own agendas and their own cultures, uh, extraterrestrials also are divided in terms of their uh, their kind of uh, species, the appearance, and their their political agendas. Um, you know, boiling it all down to the, the simplest terms, I think in a way. Uh, extraterrestrials can be divided into into groups that are all into kind of a, a centralized control and and they will manipulate people to achieve that and other groups of extraterrestrials which are largely the human looking groups but not exclusively who are more freedom loving and kind of like democratic in principle so in a, in a way the extraterrestrials mirror the kind of political ideologies uh, of, of humanity. I mean, you can go back all the way to, to the ancient Greeks and you see the same thing. You know, you, you see uh, two factions. You know, one was the, the Greeks that loved uh, democracy, freedom and liberty. And then you had the Persians that were all were about centralized control under one monolithic rule. And, you know, that battle has been going on for thousands of years on Earth. And it's the same battle on, uh, that's going on in space between the different extraterrestrial factions. That's unbelievable. Um, you point to one in your book, you, and you point to one such incident where the DIA, the Department of the Defense Intelligence Agency, leaks a leaked memo that came out confirming this. And this, it, I think it was in 1989 that this memo came out. Um, the leaked DIA document reveals how human-like Nordic extraterrestrials are friendly and can be relied upon. And we've had this relationship. So this comes right from the government. We have these documents from the, the, the Defense Intelligence Agency. What specifically do they say and talk about? And how was this first revealed to you? I mean, how did you first learn about this? Yeah, this was a document that was released by a late night radio host, uh, Heather Wade. Uh, and she released it, I think it was around 2018. It was a Defense Intelligence Agency document uh, dated from 1989. And you know there were a number of people that checked this document. One uh, that I've worked with closely was uh, Dr. Robert Wood, who is uh, one of the people behind the Majestic Documents uh, website, and and he specialised in uh, examining with kind of forensic uh, detail uh, the genuineness of different documents that have been leaked that purport to be official government documents but haven't been acknowledged to be so so he he studied this document and uh, he 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 was able to dra trace down that this was very likely a briefing document that was given in 1989 to an incoming member of the Majestic 12 control group, that one member was was being replaced, another one was coming in. So they gave him a, a briefing on what what's the state of affairs out there, and and to kind of like boil it all down in terms of you know, the different extraterrestrial groups out there, it described four categories of of extraterrestrials. You know, one are the, are the human looking uh, extraterrestrials. Uh, it described them as pretty much the way uh, my source, JP, and others have described these Nordic human-looking groups as, as friendly to humanity, as potentially good allies. And then, then it described the second category, the, the kind of biological greys that, uh, that are pervasive in terms of the abduction um, tech, uh, literature. And it described two other categories in, involving kind of like transmorphic entities and so forth. But the interesting thing about this is that this, this document was the first time, the leaking of this document was the first time that any leaked official document discussed human looking extraterrestrials as interacting with us. I mean, there's there's been hundreds of leaked documents that have come out previously that have been analyzed by many, but they never talked about human looking extraterrestrials. So, you know, what that suggests, the leaking of this document suggests is that uh, people within the military uh, by 2018 when this document was released, they wanted the world to get ready that there are human looking extraterrestrials out there and that they are friendly, they can become reliable partners. And I thought that was a very significant development because that had never happened before. 
And so that I think is kind of matches with, you know, this kind of growing amount or pool of information concerning people having contacts with human looking extraterrestrials that are here to help us um, adjust and prepare for this future where we become a member of this kind of galactic community. So when I talk about the secret space program, to me, this is, it's utterly fascinating, this idea that there are American members of the military. Well, actually, why don't you tell us, what is the secret space program? If, if, uh, if someone has never heard of this as a concept, do, you know, doesn't understand how this functions, what its relationship is, where the military, where the base is, what type of craft, who's involved with this. And there's been a number of people that have come forward publicly admitting that they've been a part of the secret space program and then privately uh, to you using, uh, you know, alternative names that you've written about and sources. So can you just tell us what is the secret space program? When did it start and what are its functions? Sure. Well, in the 1940s and 1950s, you have a lot of alien technologies uh, being found all over the pro all over the planet. And so you, you have... Uh, uh, various corporations and think tanks involved in the study and reverse engineering of these in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, so by the you know, late 50s and early 60s, you have the first prototypes being developed of anti-gravity craft. Um, and, and you can actually um, confirm this by looking at in the literature of the aerospace industries in the, in the 1950s. Uh, first, there was a discussion, prominent discussion in official air aviation magazines about the future of anti-gravity technology, how the rocket industry was a, was a dinosaur, everything is going to be anti-gravity in the future. And then by the late 50s, it all went dark you didn't find any mention in the aerospace journals about anti-gravity technology anymore. And that's when the decision was made that this kind of technology is not going to be released into the public arena. It's going to be developed secretly to develop these uh, space programs with uh, fleets of anti-gravity craft. So that's what happened. So late 50s, early 60s, you have the first prototypes developed. Uh, by the late uh, 70s, you, you have uh, the very first... Um, uh, space carriers. The U.S. Navy in the late 70s developed the very first space carriers where you where they would actually deploy battle fleets in deep space. And so in the 70s and 80s, the Navy deployed eight of these fully functional battle fleets, space carriers with space cruisers, space destroyers uh, operating in space in the 1980s. And of course, the American public wasn't told anything about that. And And since then, you know, it, it continues to develop. They have uh, uh, more refined, uh, more powerful uh, technologies out there. And, you know, this was all done secretly. And, and with the creation of Space Force, uh, I think what that signified is that there was an attempt to bring that incredible, uh, the technologies, the personnel, um, all of the functions and projects that are happening in deep space through these secret space programs, kind of like uh, to bring those into the white world where they would be treated like any normal military service where, you know, Congress appropriates funding, approves their projects and activities. And so that's, that's what's going on right now, that there is an attempt to bring these secret space programs out of this kind of deep, dark world of black projects into the open source literature. And so you mentioned 1940s, 50s, when they're discovering these, uh, these craft, they're discovering alien technologies. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Were these crash retrievals that included bodies, were they then immediately starting the process of reverse engineering where they found in the United States and all around the world? And why suddenly were we finding these in the 1940s and 50s? Were, you know, does any of this predate that time, the stuff that goes back hundreds of years, or was it really the 1940s where we started discovering these things? Well, the 1940s uh, really was the, the kind of tipping point in terms of the uh, large numbers of extraterrestrials visiting our world. I think before that time, you know, we weren't of great interest, and I think uh, the development of nuclear weapons was the kind of catalyst for greater level of interest uh, by extraterrestrials in our uh, planetary affairs. And, and I think, you know, when you look at um, uh, atomic weapons, especially uh, thermonuclear weapons, I mean, they disrupt the space-time continuum in a, in a major way. And so it would be natural for extraterrestrials that kind of travel through these uh, different routes through this part of the Milky Way to be concerned about 
us developing these kinds of uh, very powerful atomic weapons. And so that's when you had more visitation. Um, uh, many of these uh, craft encountered difficulties here. I, I think uh, the development of kind of active sonar, uh, directed energy weapons by the military uh, led to uh, some of these craft being shot down. I think the Roswell Army uh, airfield case, you know, the Roswell crash, that was a good example of these craft being shot down. And so, yeah, that's that's when uh, you have a program set up to study uh, these uh, retrieved uh, UFOs, whether they were brought down under kind of like um, some kind of storm activity, because even though the extraterrestrials can travel here using very large kilometer size or mile, you know, several miles long space craft or, or motherships, when they come to the earth, I mean, they, they send scout craft or smaller craft and those smaller craft are vulnerable to the weather conditions on earth, kind of, uh, you know, ionospheric um, disturbances or directed energy weapons. So they crash, some of these crash. Um, and so, yeah, that's been, uh, teams have been set up. Uh, initially, there was a, a group that was set up by uh, U.S. Army Intelligence called the Inter Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit. And that was a, a real organization set up by the Army, and that was then taken over by uh, the U.S. Air Force. And they set up their own crash retrieval operation. Um, and that, that was uh, Project Moondust and Project uh, Bluefly. And th these are actual existing programs that you can confirm through Freedom of Information Act requests that these have been confirmed. These programs did exist to recover foreign technologies. And, and so, uh, yeah, this, these uh, finding and retrieving crashed extraterrestrial spacecraft in the United States and all over the world has been a primary concern for the United States and other major nations such as uh, Russia and China for, for decades. And so now we have these craft, we are reverse engineering them, not only are we reverse engineering them, the anti-gravity anti, uh, technology, but we, we've developed massive fleets of these vehicles. Um, where are these kept? Are they kept uh, at normal U.S. military bases? Um, in your research, do you have some insight into that? Of course, you've written a book on Antarctica uh, and its hidden history and the, the foundations of the secret space program. So where are these massive fleets being kept? Have you seen pictures of them? Have you seen evidence of them? Have you seen videos of them? Have you gotten to see them personally? Um, and I think that's one thing that Americans would love to know is, when are we going to see these things? Uh, and for a lot of disbelievers, they're going to say, when will these show up on the White House lawn so that we can actually see these for the first time? And then I'll be a believer. Uh, sure. Well, actually, um, in the book, uh, U.S. Army Insiders Missions, uh, there's uh, dozens of photos uh, that uh, JP took of the uh, flying triangle craft and flying rectangle shaped craft out of McDill, operating out of McDill Air Force Base. So not only did he have direct experiences with the craft and the personnel in these craft, because he was taken on several occasions by these craft, he was able to take pictures of these. And he was actually encouraged to do so. This is this was before the, he joined the army. This is while he was a civilian. And it was because of his relationship with these um, Nordic extraterrestrials that he was encouraged to do that. So, so there are photos of these craft operating out of Special Operations Command at MacDill Air Force Base. So they're in the book. I actually have some of them on my website. So people can look at it. And, and no one has offered to kind of look at these in terms of uh, examine them and, and look at uh, other witness reports confirming that. You know, people ignored it because people you know, weren't ready. Now I think we were at a point where people will pay attention to this. But, yeah, there's um, a lot of photographs and videos now being taken of uh, these craft that do operate all all over the world, and uh, certainly there are places like uh, Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah, Utah, where uh, there are massive underground facilities where these uh, fleets of anti gravity craft are, are built and and then deployed by the military. I mean, you, you look at Dugway Proving Grounds. I mean, there have been insiders coming forward saying that uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman actually do have um, contractor facilities at Dugway Proving Ground. So why would major aerospace companies uh, have kind of like uh, uh, units operating out of Dugway Proving Ground? So it's because they're, they're building these things there and that's happening in Antarctica as well. And Antarctica, 
you know, that's been a major facility, uh, major underground caverns there in Antarctica uh, that are very, uh, that are quite warm in terms of uh, the heat generated from nearby volcanoes that create a an ambience there where it's hospitable for life two miles under the ice in Antarctica. There are very large caverns which are hospitable for life. And you know, this has actually been uh, proved. I mean, the scientists have confirmed this because of the volcanic activity, thermal activity, that Antarctica has the conditions that can host life. And so this is where you have these massive underground facilities in Antarctica that have been built uh, and they have been producing uh, these fleets of anti-gravity spacecraft that have been used in these deep space operations. It's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, almost I've heard of these these reports of the like underground city in Antarctica. Underground cities because they're so massive. Um, unbelievable. So when you look at the the secret space program and the relationship, I kind of want to just pick that up, dive a little bit more deeply into this now. You have members of the U.S. military who have been recruited, brought, brought in to be a part of this, um, to not only pilot these craft, but also be involved in the, the political sort of relationships between human beings and extraterrestrials and having off-world meetings. Is that also, I get from JP's reports in your book that they're going on these craft and they're, they're going to off-world meetings, both I mean, in other places like the moon, a moon base and, and other places. Can you talk about that? Well, that's right. Yes. Uh, one of the, the big meetings uh, that, that happened was in 2021, where apparently there were uh, a new group of extraterrestrials arriving in our solar system. And so Space Command put together a mission to kind of, you know, almost like a meet and greet, uh, where they went to meet these new extraterrestrial visitors saying, well, welcome, uh, you know, we, we're, the, we're the local humans, you know, we're the ones that uh, are ultimately responsible and custodians for our solar system, and we're glad you're here, and uh, yeah, we'd like to work with you and reach agreements. And so uh, he described uh, that, that mission, and he described going to Ganymede, uh, one of the moons of Jupiter, where he says that uh, he saw uh, these ancient facilities there built by extraterrestrials that are still uh, being used to this day. And he met uh, with some different extraterrestrial groups. Some, uh, some of these facilities were actually handed over to Space Command. So Space Command has been sending uh, equipment, personnel to Ganymede, uh, equipping some of these bases there as a kind of like a deep space outpost for U.S. Space Command. So, you know, this is, this is all going on. And, and the thing is that there are people that know this is the time where all of this has to be revealed that it, all of this, these kind of massive deep space operations can't continue to be funded covertly through the CIA using these kind of illegal kind of drug running, uh, weapon smuggling, kind of like uh, black budget activities to raise the enormous funds needed to for these kinds of deep space projects that all have to be conducted using uh, funds that are not appropriated by Congress because, you know, Congress doesn't have oversight of this simply because it doesn't allocate any funding for these deep space operations. So, so this is why uh, people uh, within the military are encouraging JP to come forward and talk about this because, you know, they want Congress to fund all of this rather than dipping into this kind of secret black budget. So when we see UFOs and people post videos of UFOs online now, I, I, to me, it's almost impossible now to tell them apart from what the United States and other world governments have built through reverse engineering, right? They might be off-world vehicles. They might be from another galaxy, uh, but they might be our own now because of the technology. Has it gotten to the point, I know Bob Lazar spoke about this a number of years ago, that when they were working on these reverse, tech, reverse engineering technologies at Area 51, that they would attempt to, to work on it, figure things out, and they just, we didn't have the technology to figure out their technology. And so we literally pulled the tarp back over it, wait another 10 years, he said, because we just didn't have the tools to analyze it. But we've, we, I just want to kind of square what Bob Lazar has reported and said with what we're hearing with these massive fleets that now we've been able to build. What do you make of the, maybe the disparity between those two, those two worlds? 
Well, I think the Bob Lazar case was a psychological operation. To It was a limited hangout. That's probably the best way of describing it. It was uh, describing the truth that uh, these extraterrestrial craft had been uh, recovered, uh, they were stored in a facility at S4, and you had some scientists coming in, playing with them, kind of looking at things. But, uh, you know, that S4 facility that Bob Lazar went to is really more a museum. It's a museum piece hosting nine recovered extraterrestrial or German flying saucer craft. Uh, so that's nine craft that, that were there that Bob Lazar saw. And, and his description of uh, these failed attempts to reverse engineer it, where he kind of described almost like the ad hoc clumsy way that the scientists were trying to understand and reverse engineer these technologies. I mean, um, yeah, he was, he was kind of like exposed to that because that was the limited hangout. What they didn't want people to know was that, in fact, these crafts had been successfully uh, reverse engineered and that they understood the principles and they were building uh, craft out of uh, places like uh, uh, Dugway Proving Ground in the underground facilities there, that Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, they were building anti-gravity spacecraft fleets, these giant space carriers that would be operating in deep space that the Navy took control of. In the, uh, in the early 80s and the late 70s, they were building these craft and deploying them using anti-gravity uh, technologies and kind of like nuclear fusion propulsion systems. So this was all happening in the 70s and 80s. And of course, by 1980s, Bob Lazar comes along and, you know, he's given exposure to uh, some of the things at this museum at S4 and thinks that, oh, well, that's the state of the art. But in fact, he was only exposed to um, a very limited uh, aspect or just a few of the older sorts of technologies. Interesting. So he was being used, basically. He was being used to, to, to expose a piece of the story, a little drip, a drip campaign that they've been doing for years, the sort of dripping. Is that right? Am I reading that correctly? Exactly. Yes. I mean, if you look at the Bob Lazar story, I mean, that, that had enormous impact uh, for, for decades on the UFO community. Uh, but it really was a limited hangout uh, because, I mean, you, what the big takeaway from Bob Lazar is that, oh, yeah, you know, these extraterrestrial technologies exist. Uh, they're being stored and studied. But, you know, uh, the, the classified system, the security over kind of overbearing security structure meant that uh, scientists weren't able to reverse engineer that. And, and that's nonsense. I mean, they had been successfully reverse engineered decades before Bob Lazar uh, got to uh, the S4 facility at Area 51. So it was a limited hangout. It was just to kind of steer people in a particular direction. And I think that's that's what uh, John D'Souza was saying about this new whistleblower, David uh, Grush, that uh, he's part of a limited hangout. He's being given uh, some information to put out, which is true. You know, everything Lazar experienced is true. Um, and, and same for Grush. You know, the, the, these programs do exist. But he's presenting it in a way, in a limited fashion, that can be used by some kind of deep state actors to perpetuate something like a false flag alien invasion. And I think, I think that's a very real possibility that we could have something like that being conducted and the American public is being, and the world public is being gaslit into believing that, yes, uh, these UFOs are real, uh, they're, they're a threat, uh, we, we need to kind of like uh, prepare for any kind of hostile action by them, uh, which is what has been happening uh, since that uh, first 2017 story that appeared in the New York Times and Politico by Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal on the existence of this ATIP and these uh, military studies of the UAP threat. Hmm. So when we talk about these craft, specifically, when we talk about these fleets of craft, how big are they? Uh, can you maybe describe from what JP has told you and other insiders have told you when they get on these craft and traveling to Jupiter, the moons of Jupiter, what do they look like? Uh, our brains, I think, go right to a Star Trek bridge, I think, or a Battlestar Galactica. Um, how are, how are they how are they functioning and who's on board United States military and Nordics or extraterrestrials who are working in tandem can you give me some of that experience f from some of these insiders 
Uh, sure, yeah, he has described being taken on these flying triangle shaped craft on multiple occasions and also flying saucer shaped craft. But the flying triangles are the ones that he describes uh, that he was involved in that, that took him into, into these different places, uh, deep space to, to, to the moon, uh, to Ganymede. Uh, he hasn't been uh, a member of the crew of one of these space carriers that I talked about. There's a, a former US Navy uh, serviceman by the name of, of William Tompkins, who, who, who was actually part of the original design teams for these uh, spacecraft carrier groups that uh, that the Navy has deployed in the late 70s and early 80s. And, and these are kind of like mile-long spacecraft uh, that are cigar shaped and that they carry dozens of kind of smaller triangle shaped craft as you know scout craft as kind of like fighter planes if you like and and so th these are so there are eight spacecraft or uh, eight space carrier groups that the navy has developed in the 1980s according to Tompkins and what others have described and you know, that is uh, called the solar warden space program it might be renamed that was the the, the uh, the code for that particular program. So JP has been taken on these uh, smaller triangle shaped crafts. So he wasn't part of the, the carrier group, but he did describe a large flotilla of space craft going to this area around Jupiter to meet with the incoming uh, extraterrestrial visitors. So he described a, a kind of an assortment of, of craft that was multinational. It, well, this is not by no means an exclusive US uh, dominated thing. You have Russia, you have China, France, other major nations with their own kind of uh, deep space assets because they've all been developing a similar craft uh, for, for decades now. And they do cooperate in these off-world off missions. And, and one of the kind of uh, sources of information I've, I've gotten is that uh, has said that around Jupiter there were meetings held that gave responsibility for our solar system to US Space Command as, as, as the kind of lead agency in an executive committee comprising six nations um, military space commands uh, and, and that that executive committee, kind of like a U United Nations Security Council, that that executive committee, committee of six would be responsible for Earth and its sp deep space operations. Unbelievable. So then when we hear the United States versus Russia, NATO versus China, Russia, uh, building U.S. military bases in the South China Sea because of the Chinese threat, um, all of those things, what do you make of that then? They're literally on the same spacecraft meeting extraterrestrials on a moon outside of Jupiter. And here they are back home carrying out massive military operations against one another. How are we to read that? Uh, it's a show. It's a big show. I mean, uh, the same thing with the Cold War. The Cold War was a big show. On the surface, uh, the, the military people and the politicians that were kind of like coming up with the budgets, coming up with the threat scenarios, coming up with the mil military spending programs. You know, they they absolutely believed that the Cold War was real and that we stood uh, on the verge of a nuclear confrontation with Russia or the Soviet Union. But but in reality, behind the scenes, uh, the, the, the overriding goal has always been to kind of understand these uh, extraterrestrial technologies, uh, the what the different extraterrestrial visitors to our planet, what their goals, what their agenda was, and to cooperate. So all of the major nations have been cooperating behind the scenes um, in, in a way that you can describe them as kind of like frenemies. Uh, they, they do cooperate because the overriding concern is to understand the significance of the extraterrestrial visitors and what their ultimate agenda is regarding the Earth. But on the other hand, they're, they're competitors. They're competitors for uh, these extraterrestrial technologies wherever they are found all over the planet. So, you know, a good example of this is uh, right now in Ukraine that there is this region of Ukraine called 
Kherson, and in Kherson, or just near Kherson city, there's a, an area called Oleshki Sands National Park. Well, according to uh, JP and other sources, there is a buried ancient space arc there under the Oleshki Sands, and, and that was a major factor for Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. And, and, you can, and there's circumstantial evidence supporting this. I mean, you look at the, the very first kind of a major military push by the, by the uh, Russian army was not in the east of the, Dom the contested Donbass e region. It was out of Crimea. And they went into, uh, uh, into uh, Kherson Oblast and took it all over and took over Oleshki Sands uh, National Park. They took it over. That was the very first military foray by the uh, Russian army. So why would they go there? And just now, with the destruction of the dam, there was a three-pronged attack by the Ukrainians. And one of those attacks, I just put it up on my Twitter feed, uh, the graphic is there, uh, shows that one of those prongs goes straight to Oleshki Sands, where this space arc is buried. So yeah, I think that this is really what drives international politics. These This kind of friendly competition between the major nations to kind of find and control these uh, ancient space arcs or ancient uh, extraterrestrial technologies that have incredible kind of uh, uh, technologies for reverse engineering. I want to talk about these space arcs. That's the in the title of your new book. And it, you blew my mind. Uh, U.S. Army insider missions, space arcs, underground cities, and ET contact. And I think for a lot of people, biblically, they think of an ark, right? They think of a giant wooden ship carrying uh, two animals of every species, saving saving them in a, in a great flood. But you make the you make the point about these space arcs for us to think differently about what an ark actually is. What are these space arcs? How long have they been here? What do they do? And that's a that's an amazing story about Kherson. Um, but yeah, please tell us what these space arcs actually are. Well, you have a good example, of course, in, in Noah's Ark, and, and people think, well, this this was uh, an ark that was built, you know, very quickly in a few months using wood to house to house kind of like you know two animals and plants, um, just a very big thing that would uh, survive kind of like forty days and nights of torrential rains and flooding. I mean, when you look at it, it. I think what it is, it's describing a factual event. So I, I think that uh, Noah's Ark is a factual event, but it, it derives from older texts. It, it derives from the uh, story of, of Utnapishtim, uh, which uh, is a Sumerian uh, legend about the, the Great Flood. And you find similar legends all over the earth. There's kind of like 200, like approximately 240 legends of floods all over the earth. And these arcs came by and kind of rescued people. And these arcs were built uh, in a collaboration between humans and extraterrestrials. Uh, in the story of Utnapishtim, the, the, one of the extraterrestrials uh, was named Enki, and he helped Utnapishtim build this craft or gave him kind of like information for building it. And, and here's the other thing. Of course, you know, we assume that uh, in this kind of pre-flood world, uh, the humans were much more primitive than us. But in fact, when we look at all of the literature, uh, the Atlanteans, I mean, this pre-flood world was actually as technologically advanced and even more so than us. So that tells us that, you know, these, these arcs that were built in this kind of pre-flood area just before the, the flood, these were not built, you know, using wood. Um, and primitive technologies. These were built using state-of-the-art technologies and, and resources that were known to the ancients that were uh, technologically much more sophisticated than, than we give them credit for. So they built these arcs, massive arcs, with the cooperation of different extraterrestrials. Uh, you know, this brings in the Sumerians and other extraterrestrial groups. So they built these very large things designed specifically to kind of like carry uh, sufficient numbers of humans and animals and plant seeds to kind of like repopulate the earth after a series of catast catastrophic events. And it wasn't just one arc. There were, uh, there were dozens of these arcs all over the planet. And so this is where you now have these stories of these submerged or hidden space arcs all over the planet. And there's competition to find them and to reverse engineer them, utilize them. And that's what you believe 
Putin may have been trying to do here by going to Kherson to apprehend one of these, if there's only nine of them around the world or there's only a handful of them to be able to secure this, um, you really think that that's a major motivation for uh, his invasion in that section, right? Uh, yes, I think that's a, a major factor. I don't think it's the only factor by any means, but certainly it, it is a major factor. And, and there's circumstantial evidence supporting these uh, claims that there is a buried space out there at, at Kherson, uh, at Oleshki Sands. And of course, Oleshki Sands itself, if you look at it, it's kind of like this circular patch of desert. Um, in the in the middle of Ukraine, it's the only sandy desert in Ukraine. So you know what causes that? I mean, the historic explanation has been well, it's overgrazing by sheep. Well, I don't think overgrazing by sheep is going to cause a desert. Uh, really, it's because of this submerged space arc, the radiation that it generates uh, creates this kind of inhospitable area for vegetation to grow in. Uh, but they, but these are all over the planet, and some are submerged under oceans. Wow. Yeah. I mean, look, the most fertile soil in the world is in Ukraine, right? Uh, famously, 15 feet deep of this amazing soil. So why you have a desert suddenly in one spot in Kyrgyzstan is a very interesting uh, piece of piece of evidence here. That's uh, that's unbelievable. Um, I have so many more questions and I, I, I know I'm running out of time, but man, I, I just I, I my brain is sort of spinning around all of these different relationships that we have with these extraterrestrials. And, um, you know, I have to think you as a, an amazing researcher and being around this, have you reached out to JP or or any of these other uh, sources and said, I would personally love to travel on one of these craft and document it if you really want to get this story out here? I'm your guy. I'm Dr. Michael Sala. Please allow me to, uh, to or Clayton here from Redacted. I would love to be a part of this. If you need an extra person to come along, have you asked that question? Have they offered that opportunity to you in any way? Um, not, not yet. I, I think that uh, the kind of current uh, arrangement I have with, with JP um, suits me quite well. I mean, he gets to go off and do these missions, and and these are dangerous. I mean, uh, I mean, Tucker Carlson did a story, um, an interview where he, he described being told by this uh, brain specialist out of Stanford Medical Center that there were over 100 uh, Air Force personnel, pilots, and so forth, you know, about 10 years ago that had suffered traumatic brain injuries or death because they approached these uh, technologies and uh, they weren't ready or they didn't have uh, you know their vibration their dna wasn't suitable and one of the things i found is that it is absolutely about dna it is about consciousness i mean if, if you try to approach some of these craft and you don't have uh, the right consciousness or the dna uh, then you're, you're going to be in trouble. You're not ready for that. And so uh, JP is ready for that. And, and certainly I'd like to think that, you know, one day I'll be ready. But uh, I'm, I'm patient to kind of like just catalog and investigate JP's claims. Uh, certainly uh, I think the time will come where probably uh, I might be asked to be on one of these missions to, con uh, to con corroborate this. And, but, I, but I think we're probably still at that stage of, of just getting the information out there, preparing people. But, you know, that's one of the things uh, JP is being told again and again by these different extraterrestrial and ancient uh, civilizations that he's encountered, that the time has arrived, that they're revealing themselves more and more, that this Las Vegas incident uh, where we have that kind of eight foot, 10 foot tall being appearing in the backyard. That, that's just one example of what's going to become much more common now that ordinary people are now going to be having these encounters. As, and as more people have these encounters, they're going to tell their friends, their family. And so the kind of mass consciousness rises. So, you know, we are, you know, really close now to the extraterrestrial presence being revealed as genuine. It's an amazing time to be alive, to to be here and experiencing this disclosure, hopefully these, uh, being able to see this in the flesh. Do you think, I mean, we're arriving at a time where, because well, you have three different investigations happening right now, right? You have the White House, you have the Pentagon, uh, and you have the NASA investigation, and there's been friction among them. So it sounds like there's still a lot of friction here. What do you make of these investigations, and do you think that they will get on the same page for a big We've got the bombshell press conference of the century, of the of all time. You know, the President of the United States is going to come out at 4 p.m. this afternoon, and standing next to him will be 
uh, you know, an eight foot being, a nine foot being, and they will make this disclosure. Like, do you think we'll see that in our lifetimes? Uh, yeah, I do. I think it, it is coming. We're getting closer and closer, but it's not going to come out of these uh, UAP investigations. I think these UAP investigations, the three you, you cited, uh, you know, that's very unusual. I mean, if you go back uh, uh, two, three years ago, I mean, there, there was zero and this whole UAP topic was ridiculed. And now all of a sudden you've got three independent investigations. And, uh, and I think what the true purpose of these investigations is is not so much to, to provide proof that UAPs exist, but I think it's to kind of like uh, get the academic community to get uh, uh, members of the mainstream media to uh, get Congress to take this topic seriously, to, to get people to start getting ready for, for what's coming. So I think that's the real goal of these three independent investigations. Because, I mean, you know, we're talking... I mean, you go back to the 1953 Robinson Panel report that actually recommended debunking UFO reports and debunking researchers such as myself, saying, you know, th these people are spouting nonsense, they should be ridiculed and ostracized, which is exactly what's been going on since 1953. So that's, that's uh, 70 years that there has been ridiculing of anyone such as myself talking about these things and so to overcome that 70 years of kind of like conditioning uh they've decided to kind of fast track uh this kind of like acclimation process for the american and world public and so you have these three separate investigations on uaps being conducted right now and that's to kind of get academia to get out of its kind of like head in the sands approach that no, we're not going to consider this to like say, no, this is real. It's a national security threat. It requires the utmost urgency and rigorous analysis. And so all of a sudden for the first time in their lives, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of professionals, academics, uh, reporters are now looking at this issue and you know, they're having to play catch up. And, and, but that's what's necessary to get everyone ready for what's to come because that official announcement that you mentioned, that kind of White House announcement, it, it is coming. Unbelievable. I, I hope so because I think you're right about that. There are people I'll know when I do a story on our show about UFOs or uh, a disclosure story or a whistleblower story, I'll see a number of people saying this is a psychological operation. They'll say this in the comments. Others will say, come on, you don't really believe this. This is all fake. I, those people have been have been brainwashed. I mean, those people have been subjected to 70 years of, of falling for it. They've basically fallen for the propaganda. Would you say that's accurate? I'm not to insult those people. Uh, that's why I said at the beginning of this to be open-minded about this. But I think they've been subjected to 70 years of propaganda. So when they see a story like this, they immediately think, oh my God, tinfoil hat. This is, uh, this is garbage. I can't believe they're talking about this. Let's go back to focusing on the war. Let's go back to focusing on the show, right? Yeah, that's exactly what's been happening. I mean, for 70 years, um, people have been conditioned into dismissing the UFO phenomenon as something that's tinfoil hat, something worthy of, of ridicule. But now there's been an official change in policy. I mean, uh, with the creation of these uh, UAP officers, now you have professionals being told, go out there and study this. Go out there and write up reports about this. You need to investigate this. So they're being told now to do the precise opposite of what they was, was told for the preceding 70 years to dismiss it. Now they're being told, go out and study this. And, and that's where you, you can, you're having now a lot of people opening up to this, investigating this. And the deeper they go down that rabbit hole, the more they find this kind of material that I've been talking about with you. Um, it goes down to this kind of like recovery of reverse, or recovery of these uh, extraterrestrial spacecraft and reverse engineering these, which is what uh, David Grush, I think what David Grush ultimately represents is like, it's almost like, okay, um, you know, for the last two, three years now, uh, you know, you have the first investigations of UAPs you know, asking, well, are they real? Uh, is this really happening? Is it extraterrestrial in origin? And now the second phase has begun with, and I think that's what uh, Grush's testimony does. It takes us into the second phase, which is uh, these re technologies 
have been recovered around the planet and they're being secretly reverse engineered in government and corporate laboratories uh, to create these spacecraft. So this is where, you know, we're now in the next phase, which is, yeah, these technologies, these extraterrestrial technologies have been found, recovered, studied, and now they're being reverse engineered. I wanted to finish with this. I have a, a viewer. Actually, I, I will say you, you are probably one of the most requested guests we've had on this show. Overwhelmingly, people in the comments will say, you've got to have Dr. Michael Sala on the show. And uh, Dennis, one of our viewers, I will do this for Dennis because he's been a gracious viewer. He said, I'd love to ask Dr. Sala a question. And he said about the, uh, the ousting of the Saqqara reptilians in 2021 and how the deep state is panicking with, without their overlords. Um, can, can you talk about that for Dennis, one of our viewers? What about these reptilian um, extraterrestrials and what do you know about this? Well, this is uh, really complex because uh, what we have is a lot of evidence going back uh, thousands of years that there are these reptilian species that have played a big role in controlling the earth. And the name of the kind of apex reptilian is Sakaar. So these are kind of like dragon-like uh, creatures, you know, eight foot to 12 foot tall. And they apparently have been forced to leave our solar system recently with the arrival of these kind of more senior species. You know, it's like when we think of extraterrestrials, we need to think of, of different tiers. Different, I mean, you have um, uh, uh, Nikolai Kardashev came up with type one, type two, type three extraterrestrial civilizations. So, uh, you know, the, the, the ones that have been kind of controlling the earth are, are like type one or type two civilizations. You know, they're able to manipulate energy at a kind of planetary and at a solar level. But the ones that have recently arrived, they are type three or even type four extraterrestrials. So they're like the big boys on the scene. You know, they've been around for millions of years. And so the reptilians suddenly realize that, oh, oh, the, the big boys are here. They're watching everything, everything that's happening here. They're recording everything. We better skedaddle. We better get out of here. Um, and uh, we'll wait for them to leave and then we'll come back. And so this is the window we have as a planetary civilization with the departure of this, of these kind of like apex predator species like the Sakaar, like uh, the Orion Greys, with their departure, temporary departure, because this more senior species, uh, coalition of 24 senior species have arrived in our solar system, uh, type three civilizations. You know, they're here to watch current events. They're here to watch our emergence into a planetary, um, into a galactic culture. They're here to watch that. But once that has happened over a period of maybe a dozen years or so, they're going to leave and then we're going to have to fend for ourselves. So it's almost like, you know, where we're breaking out of the shell, the insular shell that has kept us kind of like ignorant of the greater uh, galaxy. Uh, but once we've broken out of the shell, like like any, like any little animal that's just broken out of a shell, um, you know, the, the parent has protected you, but you're on your own now, you know, good luck. And that's where we are as a species. So, you know, we've got 10 years now, I think, to kind of prepare for the departure of this senior species, type three civilization, and the return of the Sakaar and their allies. Wow. Well, thank you for answering that for Dennis. Great question and uh, great answer. Unbelievable. Um, well, doctor, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I could talk for hours about this and I hope you'll come back. I hope we'll have you back on the show many, many times uh, over the next few years. It would be really uh, our, our pleasure to have you. Um, your new book called U.S. Army Insider Missions, Space Arcs, Underground Cities and ET Contact about the secret space programs, book number eight. Go grab it right now. Read it. It's unbelievable. Um, of course, your document, documenting of what JP has experienced in these missions um, is really just eye-opening. Um, so I encourage all of you to go read that. Of course, you can read Dr. Sala's writings on his website at exopolitics.org, where he updates it regularly with stories just like what we were talking about in today's show. Doctor, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here on the show. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.